All right, everybody, welcome to Venues Now and Polestar's Facebook Live one-on-one -on -one digital sessions. Uh, we have an amazing guest with us today who I'm super excited to talk to. Uh, her name is Camila Forbes. She's the executive producer of the world famous Apollo. Oh my God, you say that name and it just resonates. You know, yeah. one of these buildings you can't get enough of. She's an award-winning director and producer. Um, she's done amazing things like co-founded the Hip Hop Theater Festival. Um, she did the What's Going On, the 40th anniversary celebration of Marvin Gaye's seminal conversation with America, um, and so much more. We're gonna get into it all. Um, so welcome, Camila. Please just thank you for being here. We're so happy to have you. Well, I'm really thrilled to be here um, and talking to you today. Uh, awesome, so just tell us a little bit about what you do, and yeah, um, yeah we'll take it from there. So my title is executive producer of the world famous Apollo Theater. Um, I've been at the Apollo, um, this September will be five years now. Um, and you know, what I do um, is that I'm, I sit on top of all of the programming. Um, so we are a nonprofit organization. Um, and uh, so we do a healthy amount of programming ourselves. Um, uh, main stage programming from music, art, from um, music, dance, film, um, opera, um, as well as theater, um, in addition to a, a very robust education program that, that sits on top of, that, that I sit on top of, in addition to our partnerships and rentals. We work heavily um, with, a, a, you know, a bevy of promoters um, throughout the city um, and um, that, that, that route tours and acts our way. So um, it keeps me very busy. When you tell people you work at the Apollo, what kind of reaction do you usually get? Oh gosh, you know, I always get the wow, the Apollo. I mean, shoot, when I when I found out I was gonna work at the Apollo, I I you know, I, I got starstruck, you know, I got starstruck, I get starstruck running to, you know, walking down 125th Street and I see that marquee. Like I, you know, um so I get it. I I get that reaction that, you know, it elicits a certain kind of reaction from people in all walks of life around the globe. Um, this is, you know, this is one of the first times ever working somewhere where that name resonates to so many people um, and what it represents, right? It representing sort of this intersection of, of Black culture um, and, and, you know, and culture and artistry and excellence. Um, and it's, and it's a, it's a, it, it makes me really proud to work there. You know, I, I think of the Maria Conda thing of things that spark joy, and I think the Apollo is one of those places that sparks joy. It's something, it's a temple, it's iconic, it's, it's, it has an incredible history. I was looking at the history before this call, um, opened in 1913. Um, there was a big campaign against it early on because they had burlesque shows. That's right, that's <laughs> right. shows you like the history though, but then it's like, Diana Washington, Ella Fitzgerald, she was a winner at the amateur night. Um, right. Jesse Smith did four weeks there. Billy Holiday, Lena Horn, um, Josephine Baker played there. Uh, Wilson Pickett, Otis Redding, Gladys Knight was an amateur night winner. Uh, Jimi Hendrix was an amateur night winner. James Brown, of course. I mean, maybe no one more synonymous. Um, it's it's it works on so many levels, and it's such an important. It's a it's a museum temple. It's all these things and you know, you being at this level and working with it, how do you even begin to continue that legacy? Yeah, well, you know, I think it's by looking forward. Um, that's how we continue, right? Um, you know, it can be really daunting because of its history, its legacy. I mean, you walk in the building and you feel this incredible energy of our history over 86 years and all of the artists that have walked across the stage from not only 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. I mean, the most iconic hip hop artists, you know, made sure that they performed at the Apollo um, in order to make sure to, you know, street cred, all of it, right? It's the Apollo. Um, but where we see ourselves now is how do we look forward? How do we influence um, future generations? Um, so they will look at back at 2020 to say, wow, look who stepped across the stage at the Apollo. They had Kamasi Washington, you know, ta -Nehisi Coates was their artist in residency, right? Like they, so that they're talking about, you know, the artists of today um, and, and who are really making a difference and an indelible difference on what and defining what our cultural and the American cultural landscape will look like 50, 60, 70 years from now. Um, so we, we see that as our responsibility. 
Yeah, and I, and I guess that's always evolving, right? Like you mentioned Kamasi, and a few years ago, I don't think many people knew who he was, and ta has right. been on a rise for a long time, but, um, you know, to have his work there is just incredible. Maybe, can you talk a little bit about the work you're doing with him? Sure, sure. So um, uh, we, we've had a relationship with him for the past few years. Um, and uh, he is at the, this past year, we, he was named our artist in residence. Um, you know, so what he's done is curated conversations like, for instance, you know, he penned the Black Panther comics. Um, so when the film Black Panther came out, um, we had a really fantastic conversation between him and um, Chad, that he moderated with Chadwick Boseman and Lupita Nyong'o, the two stars of the film. Um, we also launched his um, most recent book um, from the Apollo, The Water Dancer. And we, he was in conversation with the greatest Oprah, right? Like, oh my God, you know, at the Apollo as a part of his residency. And another really um, pivotal work is that we took his work uh, Between the World and Me and adapted it as a theatrical piece um, and um, brought in the amazing Jason Moran and uh, who built a beautiful live score um, and brought some incredible readers um, to interpret the language of ta So we've been finding really interesting ways to kind of in, interrogate, um, you know, his work, be in conversation with him as just an interesting artist, creative thinker of this generation. Um, didn't that latter work, uh, you did, it wasn't just in New York, right? It was taken elsewhere. Yeah. That's right. So we took that work to not only, um, we took it to the Kennedy Center. So it ran at the Kennedy Center. Um, this was in 2018, ran at the Apollo. Um, and last year uh, was restaged at the Apollo and then was also in Atlanta at the Woodruff Arts Center um, at the um, this Atlanta Symphony Hall down there. So that's a whole new role though of producing work that could be used in other performing arts centers or theaters. It, it, it absolutely is. Um, and it's a path that I think once, once we really start to, to de kind of de delve deeper into as a nonprofit, what is our mission? What are we here to do? How are we serving? Um, you know, what started to really surface was this idea of contributing to the canon, right? What is the artistic canon that will be talked about? Like you named Bessie Smith, you named Lena Horne. What are those seminal works that we'll talk about 50 years from now? Well, we want to be in a position to be able to um, commission those works, to build those works, to give those works a home, um, that they can be cultivated and nurtured um, and, and then be set into the world. Um, yeah. So we see that with the work with ta We also co-commissioned an, an opera um, with Opera Philadelphia called We Shall Not Be Moved that was directed by Bill T. Jones. That's another one of those works that I think we'll be continually talking about um, from, from future time to come. So, and that, the opera's getting toured as well? And the opera did tour. Uh, so it was here in New York. It went down to Philadelphia. Um, it went to the Netherlands, um, to the National Opera House there. Um, and then also the Paris, um, um, in Paris. I mean, it's so interesting that you're, so you're also, I mean, you're the director and you're curating, but you're also creating at the same time, right? I mean, and that's- yeah. That's a lot of hats to wear right there. It's a lot of hats. It's a lot of hats. Well, I, I see it almost like an artistic director, right, of a regional theater where there's certain projects that I'll, I can, um, you know, we'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper in. And then there's certain projects where it's just, it's more so about the curatorial vision. Um, you know, where we see ourselves also is, um, is, is, really cultivating the institution, not just as a venue where artists come and they play two nights and then they leave. People talk about the Apollo over the last 86 years as a home, as a cultivator. And, and we take that very seriously. So I think it's interesting as me, as artistic leadership, also as an artist, as a responsibility to always center um, and make sure that artists and art are at the center of everything we do. Um, and, and we are really cultivating much longer term and long standing relationships with artists. Um, so it may look like commissioning. Um, it may look like, you know, a residency program over the course of three years where we're building a longer term relationship with artists. It may look like, um, or, or it might just be one night. Um, but the, the idea is that there's many different avenues that we can integrate and interface um, with artists and with creatives, um, not just one. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you're hearing the binging, but like my phone is blowing up and I can't make it stop. So oh, ignore. I do, I do. I thought it was mine. That's why I was like, wait. Like, yeah, this is like, it's just whatever. It's whatever day. It's Thursday. This is what happened. All good. All good. Um, so 
one of the amazing aspects about the Apollo, I think that it transcends your, your traditional venue, although a lot of venues actually have this, especially as they age, um, is it has a real communal aspect. And when I was in New York back in the day, I went when James Brown died up to the Apollo and saw his casket and um, Reverend Sharperton was there. And I know when Michael Jackson passed, it became a place. When Prince passed, it became a place. Like, it's an it's it's so much more than a venue. It's it's right. something. It's a community center. Maybe you can talk a bit about that aspect, sure. which is amazing. Well, I mean, there's a there's a real sort of I think spiritual aspect about the building, about it really truly being the center of a community. Um, I like to say like it's an intersection of art and culture, but also you know in ways the capital of Black America, right? Like people think about the Apollo in that way, and also as a shrine. So yes, when 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 Aretha passed, right? Like we knew immediately that you know we have to make space for community to mourn, um, and 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 that's a that. That's our role as a venue. Um, we, you know, I, I think even now, um, even as a shrine, but as a, as a gathering space, we also have programs that really address that as well through our community programs, um, whether it's panel discussions around um, issues that are affecting our community, um, whether it's, um, um, we also see our platform as in a programmatic area of our marquee. Um, our, our marquee is an area in which, you know, when people passed, we want to make sure to honor them in the best way possible, and, and we make sure to amplify that on our marquee. Um, so most recently, you know, um, Andre Harrell, um, a giant in our community and a close friend of the institutions, um, you know, we made sure to, to, to honor his contributions to, um, to culture and music culture, um, you know, on the marquee. Um, most recently, you know, we've been using our platform to amplify messages for for social justice, um, you know, and community engagement and Black joy, um, be it not only the marquee, but also our social, this has now been extended into our um, social media platforms as well. Yeah, we put on our cover, we have These Lives Matter in the marquee during this time, and it was, it was so powerful. And just in terms of like how you, you know, something happens in the community, are there people on your staff who are like either community relations or, or you know, there's going to be somebody passes and thousands of people are going to come to the front of the building. Like, how do you handle community interaction and um, security and safety as well? And how does how does that integrate with that with the neighborhood and the city and the world? I mean, it, TV cameras come there when something happens, too. I'm sure there's a lot going on. Well, I think we think of our all, all of it's particularly the executives and the leaderships in the institution and quite frankly, in all of the staff, you know, we, um, we, we are all, you know, mem community relations, right? Um, but we do have specific roles um, within, um, within our staff. Um, I will say that our, 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 you know, our senior director of communication really stays on the front line around um, and, and that's, you know, she's really fantastic and amazing and really stays on the front line with the ear to the ground around what is happening in the world. Um, we also have a community directors um, um, who, who directs our community programs. So these are the public facing programs that are being responsive to what is happening in the world. Um, right. So, you know, um, but it is important that, you know, I think that, but in, in regards to on the other side of it, from a venue perspective, um, we have great relationships with our um, uh, retail businesses within Harlem, um, other community-based nonprofits within Harlem, um, within our neighboring community, but also within the city. Um, you know, that's that's extremely important. And, and I think that we're blessed also as a venue because um, there is a certain amount of reverence given to, um, not only by these institutions, public, um, uh, you know, public governmental, et cetera, a reverence that's given to the Apollo, um, but also just audience. Um, so there is that very respectful line about the Apollo um, that 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 people always um, and, and I guess it's that it's that sense of holy ground, right? That people um, give us and provide for us, which which I think makes the idea of of safety and security, um, you know, probably not as challenging as potentially at other venues. Yeah, it's just beloved. Um, so another aspect that I, I, I think you're, it's nonprofit, right? You're not. We are absolutely. We've been a nonprofit since 1991. Right. Um, so we've had, there were several individual owners prior to that um, since 1934, but um, yeah, we are. So we're governed by a board of directors. So, and that means that um, in terms of 
keeping the lights on is a lot of fundraising, I would think, all the time, right? Is that, is that also part of the pressure maybe you have? And maybe it's an opportunity also. Sure. Um, yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, again, how we keep our engine running is a combination of contributed as well as earned revenue, right? So, um, you know, contributed is, is from individual donations to foundations, to grants, et cetera, um, state and city. Um, and, 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 you know, that was strategically done because it was our last individual owner, um, who was Percy Sutton, um, realized that the model of a 1500 seat venue, the economic model, um, um, in New York City uh, was extremely difficult and quite frankly not viable um, hmm. to, to run as a for-profit entity any longer at that time. And this was like the 90s, um, late 80s, 90s. So he has started developing other properties to help run the institution. So that's where Showtime was built, right? The TV show. That's where these other entities were around the Apollo brand were really used to help to fund the engine. 1991, um, you know, it really was determined that actually we need to take another shift. Um, and that other shift was um, more mission-based. So the nonprofit status really came out of a need around um, what is an economic, a viable economic, you know, um, uh, model. Um, but then out of that emerged, but we also have mission to community. Mm. Um, and how do we make sure that that sits first and front and center? right, um, um, is, is our mission and vision to community. Um, and community defined as our local community in New York City, but also our national and global community, right? So let's talk about some of the programs that's, that are there that it kind of knocked me out when you we talked about this for the story <clears throat> that's in venues now in Polestar. Um, but it, you got, it's incredible how wide reaching some of these programs are and the people you reach and uh, you know, the breadth of it. Um, can you talk a bit about some of those? Sure. So um, I think we, what we definitely talked about for the article was our education program. Yes. Um, and which um, I love talking about because I think when people think of the Apollo, they think of a lot of things. They think of, you know, all of the stars who came across. Um, but, but over the last 10 years, we, we have built a truly, um, I think, phenomenal and, 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 and an education program that's leading the way in many ways, right? Um, um, we serve close to 30,000 young people per year. That's um, and, and, and exactly. How, and big is, how big is your team? We're full-time staff of 80. Of 80, okay, good. Mm -hmm. All right, I didn't mean to interrupt you. So 30,000, you said, right? 30,000. 30,000, and, and we serve through, through several different programs, right? We have a program called School Day Live, which it's offering either um, low cost and or free program, daytime programming uh, for young people. Um, and so we're talking about whether that's music or, or theater. Um, we have a sort of a series that runs throughout the year and you know, the school buses c pull up. And in some cases, sometimes these are the kids' first time ever in a theater. I mean, I remember my first time ever in a theater growing up in Chicago was on a school trip. Right. Yeah. And, and so, you know, we want to make sure that that's special, um, that these young, young people feel at home when they walk into the theater um, and that it's a memorable experience. So that's a school day live program. Um, another aspect is um, we, we have an in-school program and an in-school program with a bevy of teaching artists um, that are in the public and private schools across New York City, um, but really sharing the curriculum that we call Apollo curriculum. Um, some of that curriculum is like some of the artists that you talked about, um, you know, like Bessie Smith, we have an amazing curriculum around Ella Fitzgerald um, and, and Billie Holiday that really talk about not only the history of their music, but the social justice impact of the music. Because through music, you have an opportunity to not only talk about, um, you know, the music sound, but also what was happening in the world that influenced Strange Fruit in 1936, right? What was happening in the world? So now we're talking about history. Now we're talking about law, right? So, um, so we have curriculum that the teaching artists throughout um, that, that are executing um, throughout the city. Um, and then the third part of our education program is a program called Apollo Theater Academy. And this is a training program for young people. And not to necessarily be on the stage because we feel that there's so many, you know, um, artistic training programs throughout the city, but to be behind the scenes. So we're teaching um, in high school age between 13 and 17 um, around um, the issues of theater, live, live event production. 
So that is from sound design, sound engineering, to lighting design, um, to um, event production, um, to stagecraft, to producing as a whole. Um, at the end of their, at the end of the program, they put on a live event. It's a program that runs throughout the summer, so it's actually running now. Um, and they put on, um, you know, using the tools, a live event production um, using all of those tools that they've been trained under. Um, what's interesting now this year is that, you know, that internship program is actually happening all through Zoom. The event that they'll be producing will be a digital event. So, you know, I, I, you know, we've had to move and adapt um, in every aspect of our business, um, yeah. even given this time of, of, of COVID. So, you know, one of the things I think we're aware of is our industry, the live industry, really needs to be more diverse. And it's, we've taken it very seriously. And programs like this are so wonderful. Like, this is what we need is people to learn those skills to go on to that next step, working professionally, maybe doing lighting or audio or production or directing or producing, whatever, however they want. Have people been able to go from your program into uh, the real world, quote unquote? Absolutely. Um, we have several members of, um, of actually a lot of success stories of young people that have either continued, we actually have someone that's still on staff in our education program that came up through our internship program and is now sitting on top of that program as an administrator. Um, um, we have young people that have gone on to work for other venues around the city, whether that's MSG, um, working for other venues like Live Nation um, or, or promoters like Live Nation. Um, um, and, you know, uh, or young people that actually may not stay in the live event business, but have learned critical leadership skills and team building skills that will ultimately help move them throughout their career. Um, so we do feel that, you know, particularly this program, you know, when we talk about being a service to the field, you know, we're training young people of color to really be leaders and, and with critical and I think vital um, um, job training skills to, to to you know, also open their ideas and open their minds to this as a viable um, um, career path. Um, you know, I know when I was coming up, um, you know, I went to school to be a doctor, right? I, I, I didn't, I didn't know that, you know, as a director, that even though I love theater and I, you know, but I, I, I didn't, I didn't have a training program like that to say, hey, this is actual a viable job. Um, this passion of yours or this hobby of yours. So, you know, I think it's important that we're introducing young people early um, to this as a viable choice and then also giving them breadcrumbs along the way that can help build their skills um, and, and, and lead to a job that, that, that hopefully will be running venues around the world and around the country. You know, do you get um, government funding, city funding, federal funding just for, because it's educational, because it's helping sure. the the citizens of New York City or from yeah. you know, every, you guys hit every borough, right? So um, yeah, is the funding just, is, is it? We do, we do get city, um, um, city, um, state um, and national government, you know, funding. It's definitely a, a robust mix of funding that we receive. Yeah. Um, are you mentoring people as well? Me personally, yes. Yeah. Yes, I am. Um, I, I always seem to have this sort of rotating, um, rotating, you know, cadre of mentees, um, and and I and I take it really seriously. Um, I think because I think I wouldn't be here if it weren't for mentors, um, if it weren't for you know individuals where you know who said, yeah, I will. I'll show you the way, I'll show you the ropes. Um, because I think in this field and particularly in the performing arts, um, you know, yeah, sure, you could go to school for it, but really um, it's the on the job training and that you really learn some of these real like true skill sets that you're building, right? And, and it takes someone to let you in the door. Um, you know, and, and, and so I, I think that's, that's, that's really critical and important that um, we all take mentorship very seriously. Um, and, and yeah, yeah, because that's our future right there. Um, good. I want to talk about your story in a minute, but I had another question about the Apollo, um, sure. which is you're expanding, right? We are there are. new venues? Two new, what, can you, what can you tell me? Yeah, sure. So we're expanding to two new venues um, on uh, right adjacent, right on 125th Street. Um, it, it was another old uh, historic theater um, called the Victoria Theater. Um, and so there are two theaters. There are two theaters currently being built in that building, uh, 199 and a 99 seat. So that'll give our total 
total performance spaces for a total of four because we'll have our main stage Apollo, um, our sound stage, which is in our historic building, um, which is 150 seats, and then these other two intimate spaces, um, as well as new office space in that building. So we're excited by that because it just, again, gives us the opportunity to really diversify the kind of programming um, that we're able to offer. Um, in addition, um, to be able to work with other cultural arts organizations um, in New York City um, and primarily cultural arts organizations of color to be in residence in those spaces as well. So um, adding to the mix of Harlem, of really being Harlem as a cultural corridor is something that I think we're really excited about and that this building um, um, allows us to, to really dream big about. So 199 and 99, so those could be more younger artists or Right. You know, people staging something for the first time or... I, exactly. I um, developing works, yeah. new works, um, works in progress, exactly that. Um, the spaces that we're so... Also, you know, they're extremely flexible. So the configuration is flexible. Um, even though with fixed seating, it's 199, we can go up to 250 without seats, right? So what does that look like? Um, um, we're, we're excited by, you know, we're having an automated retractable seating in that space. So, you know, it's the setup and breakdown, you know, that, that excites me. <laughs> because, is there an ETA on that? Um, yeah, so we're looking at 21. 21. Uh, and, and fall, fall of 21. Good. Um, so tell me about your stubborn parents. <laughs> <laughs> my mom's gonna kill me. Oh no, my God. But when I asked you, I was like, so you know, tell me where it all starts with you. No, like, you know, I know. Like, my stubborn parents, which I, I can relate to. My, mind I you, I can relate. <laughs> she kills me every time I talk about that. But um, but 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 really, I think it was, you know, um my and it, it starts there, right? They, um, I come from Jamaican parents who moved to the States for a better opportunity um, mm -hmm. for their kids. Um, and, and so, you know, they were, but at the same time, you know, they always took me to the theater. We were yeah. always immersed, you know, I had piano lessons from I was seven, right? Like I was always immersed in culture arts. Like how could you not expect me to fall in love with this, right? Um, um, but at the same time, you know, so they, uh, wanted me on one path and 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 I diverted um, um, and so that's the lesson you need Jamaican stubborn parents basically that's right you do <laughs> do well you do, well. You, do. <laughs> <laughs> you do because you know what it was and what it really taught me is that you know they were um, supportive in the way that if and and I remember is that if this is what you really want to do you got to fight for it mm. you know that um, they realized that nothing was 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 handed to them and you know coming here and having to make a way on their own um you know they you know not having parents to say here's a job for you um so it it so i i had to figure it out um you know and it's make the road while walking find those mentors find opportunities um and so that was the hunger that drew drew me um you know when i was younger and 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 i'd like to recognize that hunger in, in young people now um, because you, you you feel that hunger of you know of, of wanting to know so they just need that 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 foot in the door they just need that one opportunity that'll lead to the next opportunity that'll lead to the next and and that's how I experienced it with my career um, because you and you know you know in this business you know the world is small so those relationships that you cultivated 20 years ago you know from especially for me I still have till today um, mentors I still talk to till today um, and ask for advice right um, and so it's important to, to constantly reach back but but yes it, it but but it was my parents <laughs> um who are so completely supportive today mom and dad i love you oh that's good <laughs> i know when i was coming up my mom used to call it my peter pan like existence <laughs> Which, yes. Yes. <laughs> they didn't love that i didn't love that yeah they might have had a point um so you caught the theater bug pretty early and theater you know, that's, that's a lot just to get to at a young age. Do you, you remember that, that what just sparked your Maria Kondo moment of like, oh my God, theater, this is something I want to just run at. Yeah, and it was a play. Um, it was a musical um, that starred a young Black Caribbean girl. Um, and I saw myself on stage in a really powerful way. I was, I was, I think I might've been maybe 12 at the time. And I remember the moment where I saw seeing yourself and your story reflected when you hadn't seen it anywhere else really in the world is a powerful tool. Um, it's a powerful tool where I felt empowered 
I felt validated, I felt seen. And it was that magic at that moment that I said, wow, I, I, I wanna figure out how to create that kind of magic for other people to feel empowered, to feel seen, to feel heard. Um, and, and that really, at the core, is what led me on the path to theater, um, was really this idea of, of you know, act, activism in a way, right? Creating other opportunities in a way, and just using the tools of light, sound, and storytelling to get there. Um, so that's where it started. And then I studied it in school. I went to Howard University um, and studied, you know, I went for medicine, but then changed to theater. Um, and, and when I came out, I was, I was doing everything in theater and in the point where I was acting, I was directing. Um, and, you know. Um, wait, 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 wait a second. Theater nerds are the worst. <laughs> ah, yes, they are. <laughs> oh my God, in high school, they are always on. They're always act. Am I acting or is this the real me? You decide. Always, like, always. Know, type A, but. They were their own little special group of people, and we loved Always. them. And we also Always. Them. And we were scared for them. But <laughs> you were able to make your way in that world in high school and in college in that direction, and your parents weren't too upset, and you were able to keep moving into it. And I and I and I continued moving into it. I continued moving into it, and um, um, and and also through college, really found um, voice through music, um, through just hip hop culture, um, through the music, through the culture, um, through producing events, um, on campus, um, and 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 so I really also was interested in kind of merging those two worlds, right? Because you know, in in sort of my music world and life, I saw an audience that was truly reflective of me that I didn't necessarily see, you know, amongst the theater world. Um, and so there was a hipness and a cool factor and, a, and, and an urgency that I think that lied within the culture, that lied within the music that I also wanted to see in the theater. Um, and, you know, from there, I uh, started collaborating with other friends and, and amongst that founded, um, a, you know, a festival called the Hip Hop Theater Festival, um, where we found artists all around the country and really all around the world. We were presenting artists from England, from Brazil, that were operating and creating theater under the title of hip hop theater. And what we found is that it was performances that were urgent. It was performances that were speaking of the time. It was performances by younger voices who considered themselves of the hip hop generation um, that were making theater. And at that time, like the other models of theater were so generationally different from who we were and mm -hmm. how we saw ourselves. So. Um, you know, that was, an, an, I think, an, an exciting path, but also a path that I think really defines for me the kind of work that I'm individually, artistically attracted to, curatorially attracted to, and the kinds of work that I think I'd like to produce. It's always, what are we saying? Why are we saying this? You know, I, I think it's really interesting that you have hip hop. I think when we spoke before, you said, I'm part of the hip hop generation. And I love that. You know, hip hop, I think, and like, you know, the kind of the higher echelons of art were mutually exclusive. You didn't see them together ever. And, you know, even to see a hip hop show, you didn't see it in a lot of the, the mainstream theaters or, or venues around New York City or elsewhere. And it was, it was just the marginalized culture, even though it was like maybe the most popular music format happening. What were some of your early uh, hip hop loves and experiences? And, and when did you kind of fall in love with the art form of hip hop? Oh, man. Jeez, that must have been middle school. <laughs> there uh, you go. Yeah, no, totally. Like I, I remember, and I, I just remember, um, um, you know, writing. Um, and and you know what it was. You know what it was. I remember. Um, I, I I I wrote like my first verse in middle school, and it was. And the reason why it was so powerful is because I had just heard um, there was a whole East Coast West Coast beef happening. Right. And um, there was um, a truce between East Coast and West Coast rappers. And I'm forgetting the song that came out. Um, but this was the this was the influence for my first verse. Right. But it was the truce about like, you know, like, let's put our guns down, that, that sort of thing. And I and I thought, wow, this is this is a really powerful tool. Right. Mm -hmm. Like this music is a powerful tool of what we can say and express and express ourselves, um, you know, in a really way that I, I, I didn't see anywhere else. Um, and so that's where I think I really fell in love. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, and you know, it feels like in recent years, we've seen like Hamilton has just exploded, right? It's like front and center in the mainstream. And that's always kind of what happens a lot with American culture, things that are on the margins go front and center and become like, 
which is great. Thank goodness for that. Sure. And you, yeah. you were there right on time is what it sounds like. You know, you're generationally part of that and could be a translator of that into bigger places. And um, uh, I think it's important to talk a bit about your time at Howard, um, where I think as you told me before, oh, and by the way, if people want to submit questions, please, by all means, um, send them up on Facebook and um, happy to ask them to Camila Forbes, executive director of the Apollo, the world famous Apollo Theater. Um, so, um, yeah, you, your, your time at Howard and the community you built there, I think is a really important part of your story. Um, can you talk a bit about that, some of the people you met, um, well, maybe a certain I, I, um, star of uh, the Black Panther? Right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah, no, they were there. There were some Burger great arts, writer, all these amazing people. I mean, it's an incredible movement you were a part of. And I'd love to hear more yeah. about it. Well, I think there were just a lot of, you know, those those were the community. It was a community of artists, um, community of thinkers, I mean, at, and college. And, and you're at an age where, honestly, you feel like um, the world is your oyster, right? And that, it, you know, so you're dreaming together and you're you're building together. Um, and, and I think it's like, I think we've, we found Howard definitely helped to build a kinship um, moving forward. So as we, we you know, our building our careers always, you know, relied on each other um, as confidants. Um, you know, I, we have a yeah as confidants as, as and so I think about that now, um, especially with like you know uh, people in our internship program. I'm always like, guys, the circle of people who you're sitting around in this program, like this is going to be your cohort. So you know, you know, hold on to them. Um, because that's 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 how you build not only careers but life. Like my husband went to Howard. Like literally, I'm building life. <laughs> like, we have a kid. <laughs> like, so there there was a lot of it was a definitely a special time and a special place. Yeah. Um. So you were going for medicine. You said when you when you got to Howard, that was your plan. I something. Yeah. Oh, I, you know, and and I and I guess um, I kept thinking like, was there some what, what, why? Um, I mean, my, my mom is in medicine, maybe that was it, but there was also something else about healing. There was something else about, you know, really reaching out to people. Um, and so sometimes it's always like, well, there, there's a core essence that's here. So that might not have been the vehicle, but I'm still always trying to reach that core essence of, of um, trying to touch, trying to heal people, um, just trying to, yeah, just reach people, communicate that kind of thing um yeah yeah so but how did you how did you pivot over from medicine to theater like what was that final like i'm done with medicine here oh we go. oh oh i oh that was very simple here I come. I, <laughs> uh, bio 101 I, it was just it was just i couldn't, I couldn't figure it out it was just, uh, and i was like you know what this is i'm gonna tap out this isn't for me <laughs> Um, you know, and the, the kids at the School of Fine Arts looked like they were having so much fun, and I was like, let's, let me go there. Um, D.C., and D.C. has a pretty vibrant arts community, African-American scene, culture, history, right. um, lots of theater uh, venues and whatnot there. Was that, did that kind of spark your... Oh, totally. I yeah. mean, D.C. is Chocolate City, you know, so... <laughs> from a pride, and then I'm at this, you know, Howard University, like, so I was just dripping in just celebration of my identity at this black school. Um, yeah. and, and then, yeah, there were so many art venues, music venues, theaters in the city that, you know, we, um, as students, we could go to, we could see, we could um, just really have our kind of minds blown. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, it was, a, it was a special place. Um, so who were some of the people in your scene? Um, if you don't mind calling them out, music, uh, music, theater, acting. It's a, it's, it's like this, when you told me I was kind of knocked back by it, it's like, it's like this next generation of, of black arts. That's just amazing. Yeah. There, God, there's so many, um, people, um, um, who we went to school with, um, from Howard, there's like Susan Kalechi Watson, um, people like, um, producers, that are out in the world, Logan Coles and Chadwick Boseman and ta Coates and, um, um, you know, folks like... Um, Dominique Morrison. 
Well, she didn't go to Howard, but that's part of my scene for sure. Yeah. Dominique more so and Katori Hall. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I know she was at University of Michigan, but um, you know, we met when we were in New York City, um, when I moved to New York City, and and she's and her and Katori, I think, just one of the leading, brilliant minds writers. Um, um, Dominique, um, you know, as a playwright, um, and Katori, both of them, um, you know. Both have shows that were on Broadway this past season, um, but you know, write about real urgent. Um, I think you know matters around our world. Um, Dominique's play D Detroit '67. When I think about that, you know, talks about sort of you know the riots that happened in Detroit in 1967, um, and and really the uprisings, right? Um, and how that is such a mirror for today. Um, yeah. And so it's it it um, yeah. So they were definitely definitely part of the scene. We all we all you know kind of built, um, learned together, um, you know, found found our voice as artists together. Um, in New York. Um, when did you put on the hip hop theater festival? When was, was that so right when you were in college? Yeah, so it was a few years, it was a few years after, so, but it was 20 years ago um, yeah. that, we, that we started that, that project. Um, and um, I partnered um, with a guy, Clyde Valentine. Um, at that time, he was running a, a hip hop mag at that time. Um, and, um, and, and Danny Hawk, who was a, a solo performer. Um, and so we had founded the festival together during that time. Um, and then started in New York City, and then it started to expand to other cities, um, Washington, DC, um, which Washington, DC's festival is actually still going on until today. Oh, wow. Um, and, and then you ended up, um, well, who is Stan Laffin? <laughs> so, um, so Stan Laffin is um, a, a TV director um, and producer, um, but was one of the first, I like to say, well, actually, I think it's, this is very true, one of the first African-American, really, directors in Hollywood. Um, he's Sanaa Lathan's dad, but um, he's got five beautiful kids also. Um, but, you know, I met him because, um, you know, from my work at the Hip Hop Theater Festival, I was working with a lot of spoken word artists at the time, and I remember I interviewed to be his assistant. Um, I was looking for a gig, um, and I was connected to him to be his assistant, and I didn't get that job, but um, he called me back to work on a show that they were just starting, which was Deaf Poetry Jam. Boom. And so, and it, it was really a really perfect natural fit because we were working with the, the festival, we were working with a lot of spoken word artists. So, um, you know, I was in that world. And so That's working on that. What did that do for you to work at the Deaf Poetry Jam? That was huge at the time. Was, it, was, was that Viacom? So that was HBO. Yep, so Viacom, yep. So that was HBO. Um, it was my first television experience. Yeah. Um, and so I worked on that and I also was the tour director of the Broadway tour of Deaf Poetry Jam. Um, but working on the TV show was, it was amazing. I mean, I, I, I learned television directing by watching Stan um, and, and, and in television producing, right? Like by, by really just, you know, being at the table. Um, and I got to, you know, opened up to other opportunities of television producing as well. Um, you know, because of that, um, because of those early deaf poetry days. Um, and so we were able to do a spin-off program of deaf poetry called Brave New Voices that really focused on the young people that also sat on HBO as well. Um, but it, it, it really, again, like I said, it was that mentorship. Um, because not only was I learning, you know, obviously I had a job to do there, but I was, I was really learning about a world and I was really learning a craft and building a skill set um, that is applicable till today. But also, Part of this, you didn't get the job as the assistant, but because you had experience doing the festival, they put you in a better position to work on the Deaf Poetry Jam. And I think that's such an important point and everyone should know, like sometimes doors close in your face and you do your own thing, but then you get rehired in a much better position because you've just done your own thing. And you're an, you're an example of that, right? Like if you got me assistant job, who knows where you'd be? I mean, sometimes getting turned down for a job is the best thing. Right, that's right. I mean, I think that's a really great point. Yeah, because um, yeah, it, it definitely, I was in a definitely different different position now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I got to learn a lot, I learned a lot. I'm sure I would, I would have learned equally as much. I, I would have learned something in that position as well, but I, um, I really got to got to learn a lot. Yeah. 
Um, and you were on broad, you were doing Broadway shows for a while, right? Yeah. So, um, um, yeah, um, from Broadway. Yeah. So, and, and, and really the first show that I did, I was, um, associate director on a play called The Mountaintop and I got to work with, um, Kenny Leon, who was the director. Um, but Mountaintop was written by Katori Hall. Um, so um, the beauty is that I was able to work with Vittori early on when she was first developing that um, work at a theater called the Lark Theater in New York City. And uh, that's all about the development of new plays and new voices. Um, and so when the show moved, um, or the show then went to England and had a run on the West End, and then it was coming to Broadway, and Kenny was attached as the lead director. Um, and I got to meet with him and, and, um, and got to be his assistant director on that. Um, and it was great because I think it was, you know, again, I had, was familiar with the work um, because of, you know, working with Katori, um, you know, several years before um, on that play. So that was my first, yes, my first, um, you know, foray into Broadway and de definitely did, um, you know, other um, uh, AD shows and, um, and, and yeah. It's, uh, what were some of the shows you did? I worked on, um, uh, Lord, uh, I did Brazen in the Sun. I, I did a play called The Lucky Guy. Um, and George Wolf was the director of that one. Um, I did Stick Fly. Um, uh, I then, um, executive there, producer by Alicia Keys, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She was the executive producer, um, and also and also did some of the sound design on that play. And um, a really beautiful kind of family drama. Um, and um, and then from there we did a. Uh, I worked with Kenny also on the Wiz. Um, which was the, the televised NBC Wiz, right. um, which was really, you know, one of those live musical event mergers, right? So that was like, wow, you know, the, the think about the world of TV and the world of, um, you know, live musical theater really colliding. Um, you know, that's a, it was definitely a, a wild experience. Um, what, were, what were some of the challenges you faced up until that point trying to break into the business and maybe getting beyond working on other people's plays or getting beyond an AD, what were, what, what, what did you face? Well, I think it's, it, it is, it is those opportunities, right? Because there's a point where, particularly in those leadership roles as the lead director, where people are like, hmm, for whatever reasons and biases, like, can she do it? <laughs> I don't know. Right, so you don't get those opportunities, um, and 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 you're not going to get the experience until you get the experience. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the big challenges is then you sort of just get you. It's very easy to sort of just get stuck in a level, right? And 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 we're seeing, you know, a, a real systemic pushback that's happening now around. Well, you know, you don't get experience until you get experience, so why are we surprised that we, you know, that there's only, you know, two black directors that really circulate the Broadway scene, right? Like, why are we surprised that, you know, when we look at who's running our venues, you know, and the diversity and the lack of diversity, um, that it's not there. Well, well, we haven't systemically made it possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think those were the big, I think, hurdles. Um, um, and, 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 and continue to be hurdles in the world um, that, um, that I think it's not just about, you know, sort of individual moxie to overcome, but I think it's the field's responsibility um, um, to fix and overcome. So what, what would you do when you face those walls? Like you just couldn't, you had some dream and you felt yourself stuck and you're for yeah. your position. How do you get past, well, what would you tell others and how did you handle that? I, I think it was a handling of like, um, you know, okay, so I don't get a seat at the table. Well, let me not even go to that table. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go build my own table. We're gonna have an outdoor picnic, right? And, and that, that's really what it was. Let's find other ways to create other opportunities and other avenues. And I think that's um, what I think allowed for even, you know, and I think about that up until today, um, you know, even with a lot of the corporate pushback that we're seeing, even though that's extremely important. Um, but I'm also like, you know, um, how are we all building new institutions? Maybe we need new institutions um, that, um, that are reflective of the world that we want to see. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, that's, that's how I see it. Yeah, and well, a couple things. I mean, 
I think your career is just, I, I, I think it's just a, it's a great paradigm for people to consider. And, you know, there's, there's, you found your passion point where, when you were young and you kind of just went for it. And that's, that's hard for a lot of people to do, especially when you got strict Jamaican parents telling you <laughs> be a doctor. And, um, and you built a community and I think that's hugely important and I, I can't be un, overestimated. You, you really, it's the only way we do it is, is, and a part of it also in putting your nose to the grindstone when you get something good is just to work as hard as you friggin' can, um, hopefully, and move up that ladder too. Um, and then when you hit walls to, yeah, who needs a wall? Like go, go around, go above, go beyond, go under, whatever you need to do. And yeah. you, you kind of have personified this, I, I think. It's just like, a, it's a great, everyone should know this. Like this is, this is, this is a great way for us to do well in our careers um, for anyone. Um, and I think the Apollo, what's so, and bringing it back to the Apollo, um, I think it's really important just to, to go over that, that community aspect and that internship um, opportunity side of it, of bringing younger people who don't have the experience, you got to get experience somewhere to break in. And so that's, right. that's what that, the, that the Apollo provides is, is crucial. And, you know, I, I you know, when you go to events like performing arts center events, or um, you, you go to some of these conferences, what do you see there? What kind of diversity do you see? Who's at the table? Yeah. Like, you know, you, especially as an African American woman, yeah. What, what what is your experience at those kind of conferences and events? You know, I think at a lot of the conferences, I feel I, I I'm very likely the only one. Uh, whether it's the only, uh, you know, black person. Uh, sometimes person of color, um, woman, um, you know, that's what I see a lot um, in the field um, and, and at these conferences. So, you know, I think it's important that, you know, we recognize that more openly and don't accept that as a given, right? And, and I think with the, the Apollo, I mean, we, 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 we are leading that conversation as we'd like to see by, as an example. Um, as, a, you know, primarily, if you look at our board, African-American-led organization with a very diverse board and a very diverse staff. Um, and, 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 and so we not only center Black arts and culture on our stage and as our core mission of centering Blackness, but that permeates throughout the institution. And so, you know, a, a lot of times institutions want to make their diversity fix by saying either, um, well, look who we present on our stages. Where is, is that really true core then to your mission if that is not represented in every aspect of your institution? Um, so, you know, that's the question that's really being asked across every industry right now. And it's about time. It's about time. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's interesting. We had, you know, the, the music business kind of shut down. They had um, the show must be paused on a Tuesday. And, and there's been a lot of really great messages but what do they really need to do like it's great to put out a big sign and say we stand with you but what concrete action should venues take in this industry to make it more diverse hiring practices yeah really really hard look at your hiring practices um and hiring practices at senior mid-level and junior positions right um and um not only hiring practices if it's a nonprofit board and a for-profit board who are sitting on the board? Who is the governance bodies, right? And, and so it, it, it's important that that is also represented. Um, um, you know, I, I think it starts there and that's just a starting point. Um, and, and, and how, what are, your, what are your value systems of culture? Um, you know, what is the culture that you're looking to cultivate? Um, making sure that that's also clear. That is a culture that is nurturing um, of, of, of the diversity within the staff that you're articulating. What about uh, you? So I've heard a lot of people will say, uh, you know, I just can't find any qualified candidates and they'll lean on that crutch. Yeah. Um, what can be done to, to rectify that? How do, how, what, when somebody says that, what's their answer to that? Like what's, and what's the solution to that? I mean, I, I think the Apollo offers some of that, I would say. Absolutely. You know, I, I, think, it's, I, I think it's look harder. Um, you know, I think a lot of times we, you know, it, it's people get lazy. And it's like, you know, well, who do I know? Well, if, if, my, if my close circle of friends is not, it, it's not within my five close circle of friends, then I can't find anyone. 
it's not really the truth. I, you know, I, I never, I don't buy it. Um, and, and so I, you know, I, I'm, I'm constantly on the phone with recruiters of, of, of pointing them to people that they need to, to, to be plugged into um, so that they are, they are clear and it's these people and communities are on their radar. Um, that's as equally as port important because I think what's, what generally is happening is that there's just a, a community of people that are just left out of the conversation um, because a conversation, quite frankly, we're not built for them, right? So how do we systematically dismantle and build a new conversation, I think is a real question. Yeah, and, and also I think internships and hiring and programs oh. that bring people in because you know when you have a crop of interns, you can see pretty quickly who's good, bad, and ugly. Sure. And like sure. you know cream rise to the top and that's right you have to find those people who, with talent you can see it and it's you know and a lot of places don't even have those programs from what a i could a lot of places see. don't it's venue, true then you should have these too right like every venue should have some sort of training program for i think, I think that's right i do I, I think that's right if not if not have it be connected to one that does um and then also really taking a look at what is the culture of your organization that is also helping to foster that right. kind of upward trajectory, right? Like that's that's equally as important, um, right? Um, for 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 successes to happen. And, and the Apollo, you you're meant you have such 20, 30,000 students. We said you must have access to incredible talent that you see all the time. Like I'm not gonna tell everybody to call you, <laughs> maybe text her, but she, um, you know, the Apollo certainly would be a great resource to start with too. I would think there'd be a lot of young talent on its way up that uh, people should be tapping. We, we've got some, uh, we've got a really great, um, again, you know, with the Apollo Theater Academy, um, they graduate into a program called our Young Producers Club, um, YPC. So that's, there's a really wealth of young talent. Um, and, and, and we're one venue, right? And, and so there's, there are other internship programs that are equally as valuable, I think, around the country. So, you know, but, but yes, we do have, um, we, we do have a, a wonderful class of young people. So if people, if they're interested in trying to get into one of these programs, they should just go to your website? Is that our website? Exactly, apollotheater.org. And um, the, under the education tab gives you all the information around when we're accepting applications for internships, um, what the process is. Um, you can find a lot of, and also what's on our website is our digital stage. So you'll find education information, but also, you know, the digital stage right now is our one avenue of programming. So uh, you yeah. can check that out as well. Awesome. Well, Camila, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. You're the awesomest. Um, thank you for this. Thank you for the Apollo. My God, it's the greatest place in the world. Um, yeah, thank you so much. It's been well, such a yay. pleasure. Can't wait to see you in person or in the virtual world. Yes, more of it, please. All right. Thank All you right. so much. Thanks, everybody who's watching. Take care.